Podcast, Thursday, November 9th, 2006. You're moving at the speed of creativity with Wesley Fryer, narrowcasting from Honolulu, Hawaii. Well, aloha from Honolulu, Hawaii, and I am actually sitting right outside, sort of a pier. It's here on Waikiki Beach, and... Um, here in Honolulu, it is about 10.07 a.m. on the 9th of November, 2006, back in Oklahoma City, in U.S. Central Time, it is 2.08 p.m., and I just thought it would be kind of cool to do a podcast from here in Hawaii and reflect a little bit about the amazing age in which we live, where boundaries are increasingly have increasingly been redefined. And if you had a chance to recently take in the K-12 online conference, the keynote that was given by David Warlick was really a a, a thought-provoking presentation, I think. And one of the reasons it was very thought-provoking was because David highlighted the fact that when we put asynchronous video online, like this video that you're watching right now, I, as the author, don't know where you are or when you are. You could be watching this today because I'm going to post this up to the Internet Archive, which is a free website that does uh, hosting of video files like this. Uh, I'm going to also post this up to YouTube. I'm going to probably uh, just save an audio-only version of this as well up uh, and post that to my blog so that folks who you know, may be listening on some kind of portable audio device might be able to listen to this. And it is just phenomenal to realize what kinds of potential we have really for use and abuse of these kinds of tools. You know, it hasn't been that long since we didn't really even have an interstate highway system in the United States. As I was flying yesterday across the United States from Oklahoma to Los Angeles, where our, our flight to Hawaii took off, and I was looking out over the Sierra Mountains, I reflected on the journey of Lewis and Clark. And, and I think Lewis and Clark set out just after the 1800, uh, after the turn of the century, uh, something like 1802, something like that. And the journey that they took, you know, took over a year in order to go to the Pacific Ocean from St. Louis, Missouri, St. Joe, I think actually, and uh, to return. They were going over uncharted territory. They were traveling by boat. They were traveling by foot. I think in some cases they possibly, you know, got some horses from some of the Native Americans that they met. But, um, you know, it was was a journey that took over a year. So even though I had a little travel problems yesterday as I was leaving um, the Midwest, I eventually managed to get here in Hawaii about 16 hours later. And I went into Google Earth to do a, a quick calculation of what the distance is between Oklahoma City and here in Honolulu, Hawaii, and it is over 3,700 miles. And so uh, just when we think about travel and transportation, I I think that there's no question we're living in an unprecedented era of human history. We have all grown up with a highway transportation system, and, you know, people who are of, of a younger generation have probably always known powered flight. I know my dad used to tell a story, or like to talk about his his own mother, who was born in 1903. And of course, 1903 was the year that the Wright brothers first flew from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. There is some debate, I guess, on whether they were indeed the first, but they're generally credited with being the first folks to do powered flight. And what happened from there, you know, is absolutely unbelievable when when it comes to the transportation system that we have here in uh, on the earth you know that is that's not something limited to just a particular country what's so different today uh, that i think has happened in the last five to ten years is the idea of communication at the speed of light and this idea that i can sit here with my laptop as i am you know on, on a beach in hawaii record some things with the built-in camera and you know probably with with about, uh, it'll take me maybe 20 20 minutes or so of of post-production work to sort of stitch these these things together, we can have uh, this entire video online available for a global audience. And that is just unbelievable. So um, we've got to think in schools about how we can leverage these tools. That's what the recent K-12 online conference was all about, 
how can we unleash the potential of these technologies for our students? And I was reading um, the blog post of Frida Foxworth from November the 1st that, uh, that she just you know, posted about a week ago, talking about the frustrations in the elementary classroom of realizing that, that these tools exist and being really excited about them, but being faced with, with the standards and the accountability movement. And I think we have to recognize that you know, change is, is really hard. And, and I don't know that I can say, because I only have a limited perspective, that we're living in the period of, of most rapid change that the world has ever known. I don't know that. If you think about the impact that electrification had upon you know, rural communities when that really, I guess, took hold in, in probably in the, in, in the late 1940s and the 1950s, uh, what an incredible difference that was to have electricity. You know, to have uh, to have lights. I uh, there's a book that I like by uh, Dr. David or Richard sorry, Richard Swinson called Margin: Restoring Balance to Overloaded Lives. And he talks about the research that shows what happened to the average time that people slept at night after electrification, uh, and it was huge. And you think about today how busy we are in our lives. Um, you know how how many things there are that are going on, and the information that that is surrounding us. So. Anyway, I'll uh, probably record a couple more thoughts today, uh, here this morning, and uh, then I'm going to put my computer away and probably not use it for a little while because our conference is actually getting underway tomorrow, and I'll be sharing four different presentations, uh, or three actually, and participating on a, on a panel discussion. And This is for the Hawaii Library Association, and I'm so excited to have a chance to visit with librarians because, in my mind, librarians really are in the center of the changing landscape of literacy in the 21st century. And it's an opportunity for the librarian to really, you know, play a pivotal role in helping others understand you know, what it means to be literate today, um, how we access information, how we share information, and really what school should mean. Because school has, has largely meant you know, consuming information and being able to regurgitate or, or share back that information for a long time, and, and a lot of traditional education means that. Today, increasingly more than ever, I think education that's authentic should mean actually creating our own products, our own knowledge products, and, and sharing those out with a global audience to get feedback from, from many folks. So um, I look forward to being here in Hawaii, of course, but also having an opportunity to learn from the folks that are here and sharing from the experiences that we're having. We, we truly live in a global village, and you know, just the fact that I'm here is a reflection of that fact. I have 100% confidence that the conveners for the Hawaii Library Association would have had no idea who Wes Fryer is or was without blogging and podcasting. And I've had my blog now, I guess, for probably about two years, and uh, you know, been doing a podcast for a little over a year. And and really, it's because of that technology sharing potential that we're able to, I guess, have have face-to-face -face experiences like this. Um, you know, and, and and I got the invitation to come out here and and attend the conference and, and visit with them. So um, I'll uh, include in the podcast show notes a link to the Hitchhiker links for this conference. And uh, hopefully there'll be some other people that'll be blogging about the conference. But, uh, you know, these are, new, these are new things, new technologies. And I think part of our role as educators is to utilize these tools, you know, get experience in, in using them and sharing with others uh, what kinds of benefits and doors that opens, but also sharing that with other people to open their eyes what the possibilities are. And that's what we're going to do this, this week together. Well, hello from the breakfast uh, terrace, I guess, of one of the restaurants that's here at the hotel where I'm staying in Honolulu. Um, I thought what I would do is make two metaphorical comparisons that are sort of on location. And uh, I'll admit that David Warlock certainly gave me the idea for this with his uh, information not traveling in straight lines on the rails for, for K-12 online. But two of the things I thought that are, that are here that really have close connections to what we see happening in, in the information landscape. Uh, first off are, are the buffet that, that's here at this particular restaurant. Um, I'm here eating my omelet uh, with all kinds of, of ingredients and um, I've uh, enjoyed some guava juice and there are, you know, 
actually there's a lot of international tourists, a lot of Asian tourists here, and so it's interesting to see you know what kinds of things are included on the buffet. I'll take a picture of some of the items on the buffet and, and kind of put it in here uh, as I as I edit this um, in a little bit. But the point is, the information landscape today is an incredible buffet. If you look at all the different sources of information, all the voices, it's really overwhelming. I think oftentimes it's easier to think about education when the choices are more limited. If we just have the textbook, we just have the teacher, we've got the encyclopedia, you know, we have some things in the library, that's a much more limited scope in terms of, of how many sources of information, pardon me, that we actually have. But today, in the 21st century, I think it's a lot like this buffet that, that we have here. It, it's overwhelming. I mean, what are all these things? What, what do they taste like? Is that going to be good for my, you know, particular diet and constitution? Um, you know, you know what the serious problem here is? It's overeating. <laughs> and if you think about information today, I mean, isn't that the problem? It's too much information and how we deal with all that information that's coming at us um, and how really, I guess, we apply some discipline at a buffet like this. Uh, I'm not probably doing a very good job because I'm going to combine my breakfast and my lunch today. Uh, but you, you got to be careful not to eat too much. And there's probably an analogy to learning here as well. It's a real challenge to think about uh, you know, working in this in this landscape that that's a vast buffet. It, it's tremendous, and it's exciting. And it's exciting to be here at this buffet and to have these choices. But it's a different experience than what we have, let's say, when we're just at the school cafeteria. And you know, for lunch today, it's going to be hamburgers, fries, and peaches. There's really not a choice. That's sort of like the traditional education that we might have had, you know, before the internet. Today, with the, with the buffet that we have, um, there, there are a lot of choices. Now, I think probably all the choices that I have here are good choices. Um, you know, I, I could eat too much bacon, I guess. That would be a bad choice. But, uh, or, or, you know, too many things that give me cholesterol. But it's not quite the same as what we see in the information landscape where there really are some dangers here. I mean, they're not, they're not serving us food that, that has razor blades in it at, at this buffet. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're not doing uh, anything that would be dangerous intentionally. But we do have people in the information landscape that are dangers. Uh, and we hear about a lot of that. So anyway, I just think that that's probably an apt metaphor to think about the information landscape. I don't know if you can see all those birds. I hope they don't spill something on my laptop. I better shut down. Um, but anyway, I, that, that, that's a metaphor for learning, and it's an exciting environment, it's an empowering environment, but it's a very different environment. It's a very challenging one that calls us as educators to really expand our skill sets as, as we work with information, as we, as we work with um, these types of, of communication technologies that allow us to not only get stuff and pull it into our classroom, but also share it out. And it, it's an exciting thing, but, but it's also a very challenging thing. Well, hello again. And uh, I am here on Waikiki Beach, just right next to the water. And uh, you probably hear the sounds of people on the beach and uh, folks playing. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how the ocean and the surf and the waves and the inherent danger that we have in the ocean and, and around the ocean and on the ocean really is similar to the environment that we have with information today and the ways that we see people responding to the water, to the ocean can also be seen as, as analogous to the ways we see schools, libraries, uh, legislators, government leaders responding as well. Uh, first, let me point out that, uh, no, I don't normally wear a necklace, but this was given to me as uh, I was greeted by my, my uh, generous host, David Breyer, who uh, is helping convene this Hawaii Library Association conference um, that's going to take place the next two days. And I am wearing my I'm blogging this shirt, I thought it was a little appropriate for today. But, um, you know, behind me, you see all kinds of people that are out enjoying the beach and they're enjoying the ocean. Personally, I grew up in the Midwest of, of, of the United States for almost my entire life. I, I think I lived in about five different states before sixth grade, but basically I, I grew up from sixth grade on in the state of Kansas and really kind of consider myself to be a 
a native of Kansas, even though I lived about the last 13 years in, in Lubbock, Texas. Now I live in Oklahoma. So, you know, coming to the ocean and, and coming to uh, be around water is a different experience for me. And personally, I guess, I, I just have a lot of, of respect and awe for the surf and for the ocean. I was talking to David, my host, last night as I came in. I had heard about, you know, people having trouble living here in Hawaii that were not born here. And he actually lived, I think, in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, uh, but has lived here for the last 15 years. And uh, one of the words they used to describe that, that feeling of, of uncomfortable or whatever is rock fever you know living here on the rock uh, and, and feeling like they're you know I guess trapped he said some people though actually have the opposite folks that have have been born here in Hawaii when they go to another place uh, they go to the mainland they feel trapped by all the land they really see the ocean as as an extension of their landscape as something that you know empowers them and, and if we think about the Polynesians who who traveled here to Hawaii, uh, however many hundreds and hundreds of years ago, the ocean was, you know, just a part of their environment and a part of their way of life. And I, I remember studying Hawaii, and I actually was here before. I, I was fortunate to be able to come here about 11 years ago on my honeymoon with my wife. I had won a trip from a travel agent here, and. Um, we, we received as a gift a week's timeshare here from, uh, from my wife's parents. So when we were here before, they talked about how the, the Polynesians um, moved, you know, probably from uh, island to island across the Pacific, you know, as the, demographic, uh, the demographics changed. They, you know, could only support so many pr people on a particular island, and so the theory is that they, you know, would put different folks on, on canoes, on boats, and, and then they would head out to the east. So what you see behind me is, you know, a very exciting landscape. It, it, it's exciting, okay? We've got surfers that are out here. Uh, not all young people, okay? They're not all teenagers. There, there's some older folks that are out here surfing. They've learned to surf. And um, I think if we think about that digital native, digital immigrant deal, you know, I don't want to say completely forget that, but part of me does because all of us are learners and it, you know I have tried actually for a little bit to, to learn how to surf uh, when I lived in Mexico and uh, it's, it's tough you know <laughs> I didn't do very well and in fact I think I saw the little scar on my chest from where I, I got a blister when I was you know on my surfboard uh, it's kind of kind of silly to think that um, I don't know I, I bear that that mark but you know, I think if I really committed myself to it, and if I was in this environment, see, I don't usually live in an environment like this, I could I could learn how to, you know, ride the waves. I, I can boogie board. All right, I'm not going to put any video of myself doing that, uh, but I have done that before. Um, however, I'm not going to be a person to go out on the north shore of Hawaii, where I understand here, you know, in the latter part of November and December, the waves start to get huge. We're talking 30 40 foot waves and they can get even larger now because of technology um, I don't know if you've heard of this movie but it's called Riding Giants we rented it off of Netflix a number of months ago and it's just an amazing story of kind of the history of surfing but <clears throat> it talks about how you know now with the deeper or longer fins on surfboards as well as jet skis you know surfers are able to, to, to surf waves that would have been absolutely impossible if they were just having to paddle out and on their own power you know get into those waves Ways. Technology has had a big impact on surfing, and particularly the, I guess, what we would consider to be extreme surfing. But my point is, this is an engaging environment, all right? Just like the information landscape that we have on the Internet, I think, is inherently engaging to people of many ages. Um, we need to recognize that, you know, just because you're not per perhaps a kid or what some people would call a digital native, that doesn't mean you can't thrive in this information environment because you're a learner and you're here watching this video I would expect because you're a learner and because you're wanting to you know reflect and grow and expand your your uh, intellectual horizons and uh, so I think that's good but let's take take a look I'm gonna <clears throat> kind of move the screen around a little bit and I don't know if you can see there's a wall out here that is actually serving as a barricade to this part of the beach and this is 
done for an explicit purpose. The reason is it calms the ocean's waves that are coming in and allows for folks, if I can kind of rotate around here, if you can see that, there are people that are out here floating, you know, in this relatively calm water. You've got the ocean coming in in the background and uh, that wall serves as a break for the waves that are coming in. So some waves will kind of come in and push, but generally it's, it's a controlled environment. So this is a dramatic ex, you know, visualization, metaphor, of what I and other people are talking about when we discuss the idea of a walled garden when it comes to digital social networking. Okay, It is probably not reasonable to take a young student or just a young person, uh, or let's just say inexperienced person, and send them right out there into you know, the, the, the waves. These aren't huge waves today. These are, I think, pretty tame waves. But still, if, if you haven't swam before, if you're not familiar with the water, if you're not comfortable in the ocean, it's going to be ridiculous to put you out there, you know, especially by yourself, uh, because you're going to have problems. You know, in fact, you might die. Now here, you know, we're not talking about super deep waves and things like that, but the point is the ocean can be dangerous, and, and the information landscape in which we live can be dangerous as well. But the metaphor here is that the hotels, I guess, or my, I think it's probably the hotel chains, but it could be the, the city of Honolulu, has built a breakwater. And so there's this area where people are able to swim, and they're able to float, they're able to play, they're able to build sandcastles. You know, we've got young kids out here, we've got, you know, moms, dads, lots of different folks. And they're able to, you know, in a, in a fairly safe environment, a walled environment, enjoy the opportunities that are here on the beach and and we need the same thing in our schools we need the same thing in our homes we need for the adults to help set up walled environments you know and I've talked before in presentations about think.com about imb.com about using environments like Moodle for safe digital social networking to let learners work out you know, what it is they can do or they can't do in this environment. Let them figure out the boundaries, okay? Because, here's the thing, all right? Look out here on, on, on the, on the um, I guess if I shift over here, beyond the breakwater, okay? Beyond the breakwater, we've got folks that are surfing, and they're out there literally on the ocean, okay? And our students are out there on the Internet today many, many times, you know, without the guidance of adults. Now, they're probably not out there by themselves. They're out there with their peers, just like these surfers are out here with each other. And, you know, they're teaching each other. They're learning from each other. But we, I don't believe, as educators, are going to be fulfilling our moral obligation to help students thrive in this world in which we live if we simply say, you know, grab your surfboard, boys and girls. Good luck. You know, ha have a good time. Um, you know, I don't know anything about surfing. I don't know anything about the ocean. I'm a digital immigrant. I, I can't do that. I think instead we need to recognize that we're all learners, okay? And, and living here in Hawaii, if I, if I lived here, um, you know, it's going to be ridiculous for me not to help teach my kids to swim. It's going to be, you know, probably ridiculous for me not to find a safe environment, a safer environment than just the ocean to help them learn how to gain those skills. So anyway, I, I hope maybe those ideas are, are illustrated for you as we think together about what, what it is that we need to do in this information landscape, how we need to help students acquire the skills that they need, and how we do it in ways that, of course, limit our liability, address you know those issues, um, because we don't want to be you know, inviting kids to do reckless and stupid things uh, that are going to endanger themselves and you know, possibly bring harm you know, to themselves, to others, and, and lawsuits to our students. We've got to be smart about this, but at the same time, um, I don't think that we uh, we want to just say, you know, forget the ocean. I, I, I reject it as as, a, as an environment for learning and for engagement, uh, and I'm just going to pretend that it's not there. So let me close with this final thought. The tide is a part of, of the ocean, right? Tides come in, the tides come out. I think that's an amazing thing to think about the gravitation of the moon actually moving all the water, you know, in the planet more to that side where the, where the moon happens to be at that particular time. That, that's incredible. If you think about the tide coming in and coming out, I mean, that's an inevitable thing, right? 
doesn't matter what you build, it doesn't matter how good of an engineer you are, it doesn't matter how good of the technology is that you have access to, the tide is still going to be a reality. And I think that we have today some people who are in this case of information technologies really trying to fight the tide, okay? They're, they're, they're trying to either fight the tide or ban the ocean. No, we're, we're not going to be here at the ocean. We're not going to play in the ocean. You know, we're not going, we're going to pretend like the ocean does not exist. Okay, that's how they're, they're treating the internet in some cases. And the point is, the ocean is here. All right, the internet is here. And we have to prepare our kids to be safe in this environment. Uh, and, and not only to be safe, but to do really cool things. I mean, it is really cool to be here in Hawaii. And, you know, I'm sure I kind of look like a dork sitting here on uh, the beach with my laptop as I, as I record this. So I will be finishing this quickly. Um, but being able to share this with a global audience, it's unbelievable. And just like I, I mentioned earlier in the podcast that I don't know that Lewis and Clark could have ever imagined a day in which we would have been able to travel in less than 24 hours and go almost 4,000 miles and then share communication. If you think about how long it took Thomas Jefferson to hear back from them, you know, it was months and months and months. And today it's instantaneous. They probably couldn't even conceptualize this kind of transportation and communication landscape that we are now living in, that's reality today. In the same way, I don't know that we can even imagine the kinds of things our students are going to be able to do with these technologies. So, look folks, there it is, okay? It's the ocean. It's the internet. It's the information landscape. It's not going away. However, we don't have to just throw our kids out there by themselves and say, good luck guys, good luck girls, you know, surf away. Instead, we can build a seawall like we have there. We can have a walled garden and an environment where we're going to practice and we're going to learn together. And then you know what? We're also going to go out into the real ocean and we're going to make decisions. We're going to help equip students to be the filter. And that's one of the biggest things missing today, at least in U.S. schools. We are trying to be the filter for kids and, and really <laughs> almost keep them off the beach entirely. All right. Yeah, they may see it from a distance, but we say don't even don't even think about going there. Okay, they are going there. They're going there on their own time, and they're going to go there in the future. There's going to be dangers, but there's also going to be tremendous opportunities. And so I think that's what we're partnered with together as educators here in in this edublogosphere, as it's called. We're partnered together to consider how it is we can leverage these technologies to, as the K-12 online conference said, unleash the potential. So. I think I'm going to go to the beach, and wherever you happen to be, and whenever you happen to be in time, I hope you're having a great day, and I'll invite you to tune in again uh, to Moving at the Speed of Creativity, which you can find, as always, at www.speedofcreativity.org. Creativity podcasts are independently produced and syndicated for a global audience by Wesley Fryer and are shared under a Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 license. Learn more at www.speedofcreativity.org.